Welcome to video three in our series on cosmological investigations. In this video, we're going to look at another kind of cosmological argument. This argument is called the contingency argument. The contingency argument is one of my favorite arguments to think about. If you know my work in philosophy, you know that I've devoted a lot of attention to this argument. The reason why I'm so fascinated by this argument is because this argument can be a very powerful tool for investigating ultimate reality. And I hope I can show you how you can use this argument to think about ultimate reality. So first, just a couple notes about the value of this particular type of argument. First, this argument digs deep into foundational principles that stand free from the winds of science. The argument depends on principles that seem to be presupposed by science itself. So that whatever science discovers, the very possibility of discovering anything depends on these more basic bedrock principles. In this respect, this argument differs from some supports of the Kalam cosmological argument that we saw. In particular, some supports of the Kalam argument appeal to the latest discoveries of science. For example, that the universe had a beginning. Some of the arguments for that are based on the latest science. Whereas in this argument from contingency, we're going to look at more basic bedrock principles. Principles that are more foundational to science itself. A related value of this argument is that it seems to stand the test of time. What I mean by this is that from the beginning of recorded history, there have been philosophers who have been thinking about this argument from different perspectives, from different cultures, and this argument stretches human history from Aristotle to Aquinas to Leibniz to contemporary philosophers, including Robert Coons, Alexander Proust, Timothy O'Connor, William Rowe, and I've also contributed to this discussion. There are many versions of this type of argument, and there's ways of developing the argument so that it withstands certain classical objections, and we'll see this as we continue. So here's the argument from a bird's eye perspective. We've seen this general picture before. The argument seeks to show that there are two parts to reality. There's a contingent part, which is dependent ultimately on a necessary part of reality. So we can say it like this, the contingency argument seeks to show that contingent things depend ultimately on something independent and in stage two, something that's special or something like God. Remember in the Kalam cosmological argument, the focus was on things that begin to exist. The thought was that things that begin to exist depend ultimately on something that does not begin to exist. This argument focuses on a broader category, things that have contingent existence. And I'll say more about this kind of existence in just a moment. Now, once again, the argument divides into two parts or two stages. There's the foundation part that seeks to show that contingent things depend on some foundation of reality. And then there's the identification part that seeks to show that this foundation has a special or supreme nature. And so we'll be looking at both of these parts in this video. So first, let's look at part one, the argument for a foundational layer of reality. To begin, let us define our terms. So we saw the term contingent thing. A contingent thing is something that could fail to exist. Its inclusion within reality is not necessary. It could be absent from reality, absent from existence. For example, consider a particular house. That house could fail to exist. It could be destroyed. Perhaps a fire burns it up and it's gone. Now the parts of that house may still exist, but that particular arrangement of the house, that's a contingent arrangement if it could fail to exist. It, that particular arrangement could be absent from reality. So that's a contingent thing, just something that could fail to exist. Then a necessary thing would be something that cannot fail to exist. It cannot not exist. Its inclusion within reality is absolutely necessary. I hesitate to give examples of necessary things because the whole point of this first part of the argument is to try to show that there is something that's necessary. And so I don't want to assume the conclusion of the argument right at the outset. But just to illustrate the idea, you might think that some necessary truths in mathematics have necessary existence. For example, you might think that the truth that one plus one equals two, that that truth must be, it must exist. It's, it's kind of like a necessary law of reality, and that this necessary law cannot not exist. Now, again, I'm not assuming that anything 
has necessary existence at the start here, but I'm just illustrating what I mean by something that has necessary existence. If it has necessary existence, then it cannot not exist. Now let me give you the general structure of the argument. First, there's the existence premise. The existence premise just says that something exists. It doesn't say the nature of existence, just that there's something that exists. If you think everything in existence is completely an illusion or just a hallucination of some sort, well then the illusion exists, the hallucination exists. And that's all that's required for this first premise. Something exists. The next premise, which is the engine for the argument, is a causal or explanatory principle. For example, a contingency argument might have a principle like this. I might say, for any contingent things, so markers, planets, people, if those things could fail to exist, then there is some cause or some explanation of their existence. Then we have a principle that specifies the kind of causation we're talking about. I call this the no circularity premise. So for example, a cause of the contingent things cannot solely be in terms of those same contingent things. I think it's helpful to think of this premise as orienting us to the kind of concept of cause we're talking about. We're talking about an external cause, something beyond the effect, something that produces the effect. And the external cause is not going to be the same thing as the effect itself. Then from these premises, we get the following result. There's something that isn't contingent, and so therefore it's a necessary thing. Remember, a necessary thing is anything that doesn't have contingent existence. It is something then that cannot not exist. And this thing is going to be foundational to the contingent things. So that's the general structure of the argument. There are many particular versions of this argument from contingency. You can create your own version of this argument by coming up with a particular principle here that links contingent things with an ultimate foundation for those things. So for example, instead of saying contingent things have a cause, you could say contingent things have some ground. Or you could focus on certain facts about contingent things. For example, there's a version of the argument that focuses on the fact that contingent things exist. Now to summarize the argument, I think it's helpful to have a picture of the whole thing. And that's what this picture is. It's a picture of the whole argument where it shows contingent things ultimately depending in some way on some necessary foundation. Okay, so that's the general picture of the argument. Let's zoom in and let's have a closer look at this second premise here. So I wanna look at the engine of the argument, which is the causal or explanatory principle. I give the example that for any contingent things, there is a cause or explanation of those things. Now, why might somebody think this principle is true? The usual supports given for this premise fall into three different types. So there's three types of support. First, there's this general support from experience. We saw this kind of support when we looked at the engine in the Kalam cosmological argument. There, we considered the premise that whatever begins to exist has a cause. So if turtles just come into being, those turtles would have some cause for coming into being. They don't just come from nothing. And I gave two supports for this principle from experience. One was our experience of seeing things have a cause, and the other was the lack of seeing things come into being without a cause. Here, I put those both together into one type of support, just the support from experience. And this will also apply to contingent things. We observe contingent things coming from other things. If a turtle exists and that turtle could possibly not exist, then that turtle seems to come from some prior thing. In fact, you might actually think that the reason that things that begin to exist have a cause is precisely because that things that begin to exist are contingent things. Their non-existence is possible. Their inclusion within reality is not a matter of necessity. So if they come into existence, then that verifies that they are contingent things. And contingent things, if they have to have a cause, that would explain why things that begin to exist have a cause. So you might think of this as sort of a deeper principle, a more fundamental principle, where the Kalam cosmological argument principle is a more specific byproduct or instance of this general principle. A second type of support is from reason. Now, personally, I think of reason itself as a kind of experience. It's not an experience with my five empirical senses. It's not the experience of seeing a rabbit or seeing a turtle. Instead, I think of reason as an experience with seeing 
more general truths. One way of seeing how reason might support this general principle that contingent things have some kind of cause or explanation comes from Richard Taylor. He tells a story of going into the woods and seeing a large sphere. So imagine you go into the woods and you see this large purple shiny sphere. Now, I don't know about you, but if I saw that, I would wonder, how did that get there? Why is there this giant sphere? Now, I don't have any kind of experience with a sphere like this in the forest. So I can't really cite other experiences saying, yeah, anytime there's a big sphere in a forest, it has some cause. I've never seen any sphere in a forest before be caused. But it seems like when I think about this case, I have a kind of intuition that the very existence of the sphere, that calls for explanation. Now, maybe if that sphere somehow had to exist, its existence were a matter of necessity then its necessity could provide a kind of explanation of its existence. But suppose instead that it doesn't necessarily exist. It has contingent existence. Its non-existence is a real possibility. Well, then my mind just sort of calls out for some kind of causal explanation, something that produced it or explains how that thing could be in existence rather than not. If you have that sense, then that sense is a sense from reason that may support this general principle that contingent things have some further cause or explanation. A third kind of support is one that we've seen before when we talked about the Kalam cosmological argument. This support comes from epistemology. The support here is based on the thought that without some kind of general principle of explanation, then we fall into a pit of radical skepticism. How do we know that our current thoughts and our current experiences don't emerge without any explanation. Why think there's any explanation of anything? And if you say that, well, maybe certain things have an explanation, but other things don't have an explanation, then what explains the difference? If you say that certain things have an explanation and others don't, and you have no explanation of this difference, you have no explanation, no account of why things in class A have an explanation, but things in class B don't have an explanation, then it's hard to see how to avoid falling into this pit of skepticism where you can't really see anything. You can't know whether your next thought has any kind of rational explanation versus just no explanation at all. Robert Coons develops a version of this argument from epistemology. And so if you want to go deeper in exploring this kind of argument, I recommend that you check out his work. So here's a summary then of the first part of the argument. The first part says that there's something rather than nothing only if there's some necessary part that causes or explains the contingent parts of reality. So what I want to do next is I want to discuss the 10 top objections. I've heard many objections to this argument, and these objections are very valuable for clarifying the argument and testing the argument. So I'm going to run through 10 objections. First, there's an objection we've seen before. This is the objection that there actually are uncaused contingent events. For example, in science, we find virtual particles that come into being from nothing without any cause. Our response to this objection is precisely the same as before, which is that the objection helps to clarify that the kind of cause that we're talking about doesn't have to be a necessitating or deterministic cause. It could just be some kind of prior condition that allows for the possibility of a contingent thing. Also, in the case of an argument from contingency, we can leave open the relationship between the effect and the prior condition. We can allow that prior condition to be a cause or a non-deterministic explanation or just some kind of minimal or minuscule explanation. One version of an argument from contingency, for example, will say that every contingent fact has some explanation. The explanation doesn't have to be logically sufficient for the effect or for the thing to be explained, but it can allow for a kind of spontaneous evolution of the world, where the states of the world are connected to each other, but they're not linked by a kind of deterministic connection. Instead, there can be real indeterminacy in the world. A second objection is also one we've seen before, which is that maybe that first event, the event of the universe coming into being, maybe that's a special event where nothing could cause that event. And my response here is, is the same as before, which is that if reason and experience provide evidence for a general principle, then if we're going to make an exception to the general principle, 
we need to have some independent evidence or motivation for making that exception. Here, let me just add another consideration, which is from irrelevant differences. It seems to me when I consider different contingent things, like a cup or a bowl or a planet or a galaxy, it seems that the differences between these contingent things aren't relevant to account for how they could just exist uncaused. For example, it seems like if a bowl depends on some prior causes or conditions for its existence, then it seems like so would a plate. And it wouldn't matter if we change the size or the shape of it, even if we expanded the object out all the way to the size of an entire universe. It seems to me that these differences in shape and size are not relevant differences. They're not relevant to account for a difference between being caused and being uncaused. A relevant difference might be that it has necessary existence. If something exists of necessity, then it doesn't begin to exist, it can't begin to exist, and you might think that there could never be anything prior to it that could produce it or that could cause it. But an event is something that comes to be. It's not something that is of necessity. It comes to be. And so the first event wouldn't have necessary existence in that sense. And so for this reason, it seems to me that being first in the order of events is not a relevant difference because that first event could still be caused by some prior condition. Of course, the condition would not itself be an event. It would have to be something else. It could be a necessary reality that produces that first event. Now, the next objection is from an infinite regress. There are two infinite regress objections. The first one is that an infinite regress removes the need for an explanation. My response here is to ask why? Why would an infinite regress remove the need for an explanation? Think about this with me. Imagine there were an infinite regress of chickens coming from other chickens all the way back to infinity. I assume that this infinite chain of chickens doesn't exist in our world. But suppose that this is a contingent reality that could exist in some other world. Well, it seems to me then that if it did exist, if there actually were this infinite chain of chickens, there would need to be some further explanation to account for the total chain. Why chickens? Why those chickens? Rather than other things like Smurfs or nothing at all. Merely adding more and more things so that you have infinitely many things. Infinitely many chickens producing other chickens. That doesn't by itself remove the need for an explanation. In fact, if anything, it only exacerbates the need for an explanation. Why would there be all those chickens all the way out to infinity? Now, maybe the thought is that if there were an infinite regress, then there couldn't be a further explanation. And since there couldn't be a further explanation, then that by itself removes the need for an explanation. But first of all, why well, think there couldn't be an explanation? Last time we talked about Rowe's example of an eternal star, where the light from that star has been coming from the star from all of eternity. In this case, there's a kind of infinite regress where each state of there being light comes from a prior state in which there was light. But the total light is explained by this deeper cause, the star itself, which has been eternally generating this light. Now, maybe you think that this is just not possible, that there just couldn't be an explanation of an infinite regress. But then that's not a reason to think that there wouldn't be an explanation of the infinite regress. That would just be a reason to think that there couldn't be an infinite regress. The argument here would be that an infinite regress would need to have a further explanation because of the general principle that contingent things can't just exist without some further explanation. But if you think that infinite regress cannot have a further explanation, and if an infinite regress must have a further explanation, then it just follows that there couldn't be an infinite regress. Now, my own view on this is that if there were an infinite regress, it could have a further explanation, and merely adding up things out to infinity does nothing at all to remove the need for that explanation. Another way to think about this is imagine an infinite regress that occurs in finite time. Imagine, for example, that you see a big blue ball just appear in front of you. And as it happens, this ball appeared through an infinite sequence of states where each state of the blue ball's appearance came from a prior state in finite time. In this case, you would have an infinite regress of states being explained by prior states. But this would not thereby remove the need for an explanation 
of the appearance of this blue ball. Just because each state comes from a prior state out to infinity does nothing to explain the existence of those states in total. And it seems like there would need to be some explanation of those states in total. In fact, it seems we can motivate this by both reason and experience. By reason, it seems like contingent things, whether finite or infinite, would have some further explanation. And by experience, it seems that we never witness any kind of big blue balls just appearing from nothing, even if its appearance undergoes an infinite sequence of events. That won't make it easier for it to come into being without an explanation. So whether the contingent world is infinitely old or finitely old, it seems that there would still be some further explanation. A second kind of infinite regress objection says not that the infinite regress removes the need for an explanation, but rather that the infinite regress constitutes an explanation. As long as these things are connected in an infinite chain, then you have an explanation of the individual. Both of these objections are associated with David Hume, but I think it's helpful to distinguish them so that we can analyze them separately. So why think that an infinite regress would constitute a complete explanation? A philosopher, Paul Edwards, illustrates this idea by telling a story about some Eskimos. In this story, there are some Eskimos that are at a certain location. Let's say that they are all located around a certain street light. And let's say that there are five Eskimos. You wonder, why are there those five Eskimos? Well, suppose you have an explanation for each Eskimo being there. So one of them is there because they're on their way to the store. Another one is there because he's on his way to visit a friend. And so on. Each Eskimo has an explanation for being there. And once we've explained all the individual Eskimos, the thought here is that we have an explanation of the whole collection of Eskimos. We don't need a further explanation of the whole collection beyond the individual explanations. Now, I actually think that that is correct in this case. The reason why the explanation of the individuals explains the whole is because the total explanation goes outside of the whole. In explaining the particular Eskimos, why they're there, the explanation isn't just in terms of those same Eskimos. Instead, the total explanation goes outside of the thing to be explained. But in the infinite regress case, it's importantly different if the entire explanation is contained within the thing to be explained. Think again about the chickens. Imagine that each chicken comes from a prior chicken all the way to infinity. Now that infinite chain, merely by connecting up the chickens in this kind of causal chain, wouldn't thereby explain why there is that causal chain. To explain that causal chain in terms of its own members is a circular explanation. It's not the kind of explanation that illuminates why there is that very chain in the first place. So it seems to me that an infinite regress is not enough by itself to constitute the full explanation of the regress itself. Richard Taylor points out that the mere age of a thing, even infinite age, doesn't explain the existence of that thing. We could still wonder, why is there that eternally old sphere? Why is that sphere purple? Why not blue? What explains the existence of that sphere in the first place? Now, maybe its eternal age is a signpost for something about its nature. Maybe it has a necessary nature. Maybe the reason that it has an eternal age is because it cannot not exist. But in that case, the sphere wouldn't be a contingent thing. The argument from contingency is an argument that contingent things have some further explanation beyond themselves. The cool thing about the argument from contingency is that it leaves open whether contingent things even had a beginning. The thought is that even if contingent things didn't have a beginning, then their infinite age wouldn't thereby constitute an explanation of their existence. There would still be this further question, why those contingent things? Why do they exist? Their inclusion within reality is not a matter of necessity. So why are they included within reality? It seems as though a further explanation is called for. Now, I don't want to overstate this. An argument doesn't have to be a complete proof to provide some reason in support of its conclusions. My thought here is just that the infinite regress does not by itself either remove the need for an explanation or constitute a complete explanation of contingent things. Objection 5, the modal collapse objection. This objection targets a particular form of the argument from contingency that appeals to a kind of deterministic explanation of contingent things. The idea here is that if there's a necessary thing that is a deterministic explanation of its effects, 
then its effects would have to be necessary. But the argument from contingency that I've presented does not require that the cause be deterministic. It leaves open the possibility of indeterministic causes. So my response to the modal collapse objection is really the same as my response to the virtual particles objection, which is that we're going to run the argument from contingency using a modest principle that leaves open the relationship between the causes and the effects. This version of the argument can allow a necessary thing to indeterministically produce contingent effects. In this way, the effects don't have to have necessary existence, but instead can be contingent. And by the way, nothing in the argument really even assumes that there are contingent things. I like to think of this first stage of the argument as inviting us to consider how there could be contingent things if there were contingent things. If there aren't any contingent things, well then everything that exists would be a necessary thing, and so that would actually be the conclusion of the first part of the argument, that there's some necessary part of reality. Then we're going to have to look at the second part of the argument, which seeks to identify the nature of this necessary thing. Next, we have the bootstrapping objection. We saw this before when we talked about the Kalam argument. The worry here is that the link between the cause and the effect would have to itself be caused or explained. So what explains the causal link between the necessary foundation of things and the contingent effects? My response to this is the same as before, which is that the causal link is not a separate thing that has to be caused in order to cause contingent things. Rather, when a necessary thing produces contingent things, or really when any cause produces any effects, whatever those effects are, it thereby produces the link between itself and the effects. The link is posterior to the cause itself. That's one kind of response that I've come to and it satisfies me. But another kind of response is just to restrict the causal principle. So we're focused on explaining the existence of contingent things, not explaining the causal activity of contingent things. Maybe there's some activity that could have no explanation, not even a probabilistic explanation. It's just uncaused activity. But the things that perform that activity, those things couldn't just exist uncaused. And that more modest or restricted principle, that would still be supported by our experience of a causal order in our world. Number seven is an objection from Kant. This objection does not usually come up in popular discussions, but I do find this sometimes in certain academic circles. The worry here, according to Kant, is that the cosmological argument presupposes the dubious ontological argument. What is he thinking here? One version of this objection is that the ontological argument has to assume that some kind of perfect reality, or at least a necessary reality, is actually possible, but that this possibility premise is contentious. And on this interpretation, I want to just respond by saying that the argument from contingency does not require the premise that a necessary reality is even possible. Maybe we have no idea whether a necessary reality is possible or impossible. We can still run the argument from contingency by having independent motivations for the principle of cause and effect or the principle of explanation. And then the conclusion of the argument will be that a necessary reality is actual. From here, you can then deduce that, well, if it's actual, then it would have to be also possible. So the point here is just that you don't have to first show that a necessary thing is possible in order to give independent reasons to think the necessary thing is actual, that it is an actual ultimate explanation of contingent things. The other thing I want to note here is that the logic of possibility and necessity has been rigorously developed since the time of Kant, and distinctions have been made that can help us to navigate through some of the objections and worries that he had. I'm going to talk more about the logic of possibility when we look at modal cosmological arguments in the fifth video. So here I just want to say that the cosmological argument doesn't actually presuppose any premise in the ontological argument. Objection 8, going back to David Hume in his Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion, he suggests that anything that could be conceived to exist could be conceived to not exist. And this conceivability of non-existence suggests that an empty world, a world empty of all things, is a possible world. Well, if that's right, then that contradicts the conclusion of the argument from contingency, because the conclusion is that there's some necessary part of reality, and a necessary part of reality would span every possible world. If there really is a necessary part of reality, 
then a completely empty world would not actually be a possibility. Now, I addressed this objection and other related objections in an article called Could God Fail to Exist? Alexander Proust and I, in a chapter in our book Necessary Existence, we also address this. Now, here, let me just make a few observations. First, notice that this objection targets the conclusion of the argument, but doesn't target any premise of the contingency argument. If the premises in the contingency argument are well supported, and if they're true, well then an empty world is not actually possible. So why think that an empty world is possible? Hume appeals to conceivability, but we need to be careful here, because in some sense we might be able to conceive of somebody disproving certain mathematical conjectures. For example, maybe Goldbach's conjecture is true, and necessarily true, yet we could conceive of somebody disproving it. We don't know whether it's true, but here the conceivability is not helping us to see what's actually possible, what's really possible. It's only helping us to see what is what we might call epistemically possible or possible for all we know. Also, we need to be careful about what we're doing when we're conceiving of an empty world. How do we conceive of an empty world? When I try to think about an empty world, I find that I have no problem subtracting out material things or things that have shape. I can just imagine there being empty space. But imagining empty space is not yet imagining absolute nothing. To imagine absolute nothing, I would have to imagine that there's no space, that there are no numbers, that there are no necessary truths, there are no mathematical truths, there are no immaterial minds. There's just nothing. Now, in some sense, maybe I can conceive of that in the way that I might be able to conceive of somebody disproving the Goldbach conjecture. But this kind of conception is not revealing what's actually possible. For again, it's possible to conceive of something that's impossible. If the Goldbach conjecture is true, then it's not even possible for it to be disproven, even if I could, in some sense, conceive of it being disproven. And let me just add here that conceivability is a two-edged sword. If one can use conceivability to verify that something is possible, well, then one could use conceivability to verify that the premises in the argument from contingency are at least possibly true. But if they're at least possibly true, then one can deduce that it's at least possible that there is a necessary thing. When we look at modal cosmological arguments, I want to show that there's reason to think that a necessary thing is only possible if it's actual. It's sort of like the Goldbox conjecture. The Goldbox conjecture is not provable unless it's actually true because it's the kind of truth that's either necessary or impossible. And if that's right, well then if we follow Hume's procedure of verifying possibilities using conceivability, then we will have an independent route to verifying the possibility of a necessary reality. And then if a necessary reality spans all possible worlds, it follows that a necessary reality is only possible if an empty world is actually not possible. Now, I realize that's a technical response. To slow down this response and, and to study it in more detail, I recommend checking out my article, Could God Fail to Exist? Finally, I think that the argument from contingency provides independent reason to think that an empty world is not possible. Nine, there's a related objection from Swinburne. Swinburne argues that an empty world is possible, but he appeals to more than just conceivability. Now, I've actually seen different iterations of Swinburne's argument. He and I had a public exchange at the American Philosophical Association where I saw one iteration of his argument. Later, he submitted an article for review for publication where I was one of the referees and I saw a further development of his argument. Rather than try to chase down the latest and best version of his argument, I want to say something that's more inclusive and more neutral, which is that even Swinburne thinks that in some sense that there's some kind of necessary part of reality on some notion of necessity. In fact, Swinburne himself develops his own cosmological argument in his book, The Existence of God. The conclusion of that argument is that there is something whose existence is at least factually necessary. Now, my own view is that the foundational reality is necessary in the strongest conceivable sense, and I developed that more in my article, Could God Fail to Exist? A final objection is a question. Why think that the universe isn't the necessary thing? 
Maybe there is a necessary reality, but maybe that reality just is the universe in total. Now, this is actually not an objection to the first part of the argument from contingency. Instead, this question invites us to consider the second part, the identification part, which is what we will do in the next video. I want to conclude this video by giving you just a few take-home points about the argument from contingency in general. First, the argument is flexible. This argument, unlike the Kalam argument, leaves open whether the universe has an infinite age. This is one thing I like about this argument. It doesn't depend on the age of the universe. Even if the universe is infinite in its age, it does not follow that contingent things can exist uncaused or that a contingent, infinitely old universe could exist without any further explanation. So the argument from contingency allows for an eternal universe. Second, the argument has a kind of resilience. Contemporary versions of the argument sidestep many of the traditional objections. Sometimes people think about Hume and Kant as people who destroyed all cosmological arguments. But no, they didn't actually place this argument into the dustbin of history. Check out William Rowe's discussion of the argument. He considers objections from Hume and Kant, yet he develops his own version of the argument, which he thinks is not undermined by any of the objections from history. And finally, this first part of the argument has a kind of inclusivity to it. Atheists and theists need not divide over this first part of the argument. The first part provides a view of the structure of reality that atheists and theists, people from many different perspectives, could come to agree upon. One of the premier atheist philosophers today, Graham Oppie, thinks that reality does have this kind of structure, with contingent things ultimately depending on an initial necessary reality. And so one can think that reality has this structure from a wide range of viewpoints about the nature of the ultimate foundation of things. In the next video, we're going to look at the identification stage of this argument. Thank you for your attention. I know we covered a lot of ground. So if you have any particular questions or even objections to this argument, please feel free to share that.